Uh, I'm really excited to be talking with Dell Harvey. Should we introduce ourselves a little bit? Sure. Um, yeah, I'll go first since I'm already talking. I'm Cheryl Conti. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Yes We Code, which is a project with Van Jones and Amy Henderson to help over. Oh, thanks. Some people have heard of it. So for those of you who haven't, it is a project to help over 100,000 young people uh, of many colors to become high quality uh, technologists and coders, just like some of you here in this room. I'm also the co-founder of Fission Strategy, which helps the world's leading nonprofits uh, and foundations to be, uh, use the internet more effectively to create change around the world. And because I don't like sleeping, I am the co-founder of Attentively, which is a big data social startup that incorporates marketing automation to rocket your ROI. So, Del, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure, and to uh, add on, you had the agreement with Kat to Samba, I had the agreement to not. <laughs> That was, that was pre-arranged, yeah, that, there was, was a, a, a definite, clear definition of roles. Yeah. I'm asking the question, she's answering them, I'm Samba-ing, Del is not Samba-ing, just so we're clear. Okay. So, <laughs> so Del... Other uh, than not yeah. Samba-ing. Yeah, but you do reference Vanilla Ice on I do. your LinkedIn profile. I do. Yeah. It actually says, my skills and experiences can best be summarized by Vanilla Ice. Yo, mm -hmm. if there was a problem, look, I'll solve it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There you have it. <laughs> I try. I try to look really like attractive to recruiters, and I think that <laughs> actually quoting Vanilla Ice goes a long way down that path. I I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. So what I do, as you mentioned, I head up trust and safety at Twitter, which is a somewhat vague but also somewhat reassuring name. Uh, the sort of stuff that falls within my department is a lot of the legal risk areas. So government requests, law enforcement requests, intellectual property, identity, advertising policies, minors and content, anything with child sexual exploitation, all that sort of range of stuff. And then anything related to sort of user trust, user rights, all that sort of stuff factors in as well. Absolutely. So you've had a very interesting career uh, so far. Um, it would be great, um, you know, if uh, you could talk a little bit about the road to Twitter. Uh, some of you may not know how famous Dell is. She actually worked with Chris Hansen on To Catch a Predator, uh, an amazing hero of mine. I didn't realize it until I got here today, you know, how much you've done to protect us on the internet already. Um, but yeah, how did, you, how did you end up at Twitter? Sort of accidentally, in a lot of ways. I you know, had spent about five years working with the nonprofit that Chris Hansen and NBC was working with. I was the co-administrator and law enforcement liaison for that organization. I think in large extent, because I was super young and chipper and enthusiastic, and I was like, I can make all of these things work. And, and I think law enforcement was just like, oh, oh, that's a lot of energy and enthusiasm. Oh, okay, we'll work with you, like, sure. <laughs> are you and, not gonna bust you know, us, are like, you? <laughs> yeah, no, they're like, okay, yeah. you're, boy, yeah. okay. Uh, and then I actually spent about a year or so while still working at the, the nonprofit, some administering psychological testing to reality TV show applicants, mm. because you know I think that's an important step in anyone's career. That's actually super important. I mean, I feel like someone should have tested some, you know, the people who are on there now. Yeah, all I of mean, the it's Kardashians, just... really, all a hundred percent of the Kardashians. That's a high percentage. I know it's a lot of reality stars right there. <laughs> that's anyway. not even getting into some of the other net. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so that was that was interesting, but I, I you know I was thinking, gosh, you know I, I'd kind of like to do something different. What should I do? And a friend of mine, who's actually the first female engineer at Twitter, had they were starting to have the occasional spammer. This was back in 2008, so it was you know kind of unheard of. Mostly the site was just down. Hmm. Yeah, I remember those days. So do, the who spammers, remembers those days when the, like 400 people tweeting at once could shut down Twitter? That used to happen. I'm not kidding. Yeah, yeah thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. Um, 
And she was, she was like, you know, I have this friend who's, you know, super, like, super anal retentive. She'd be great for dealing with this. She didn't tell me at the time that that was how she described me. <laughs> uh, it's all good now, right? Yeah, it's great now. <laughs> But they ended up saying, you know, oh, hey, would this be, you know, would you be interested in this? I was like, well, that's, this is a whole different realm. And it was originally just spam and abuse that I was going to be, you know, looking at. And abuse really in the context of spam more than anything else. And I, and I started, and a couple of weeks in, I, I was asking Ev and Biz, you know, well, what policies do you have in place around all of these other things? And they were just kind of like, what do you mean? By policy. Yeah, like, <laughs> when you say policy, right? <laughs> what do you think in here? <laughs> because you could also create it for us. Yeah, and it yeah. turned into, you know mm -hmm. what? If you like these policies so much, you, you go ahead. You take those. Mm -hmm. So I sort of ended up heading up safety, trust and safety at Twitter because people were like, oh, good. You'll do that. So, well, I we're going to go do product and engineering over here. Right. You take all that stuff that sounds horrifying and just go on over there. Well, and which is something that I do try, you know, including with Yes We Code, to encourage people to think of, you know, the world of technology as more than just coding, right? Like there's, there are, you know, lots of different ways in which people can participate and help to build, you know, safe environments and a, and a great product. Absolutely. Yeah. I will say that for the first six months or so, we, there were just really no tools, like there, nothing was built. Mm -hmm. So for like about six months, I just had uh, command line access to the site. Wow. And I had a little index card taped to my computer that had, you know, the commands that I used most on it just jotted down so I could put them in terminal and, you know. Nothing at all terrifying about that in retrospect, Nothing. let me no. assure you. Wow, yeah. Uh, so speaking of which, uh, I'm sure that worked at first, right, in 2008, but then there's the challenge that many emerging tech companies face, which is scaling, yep. right? So, you know, how would you describe, you know, your philosophy and, pr and approach, you know, to scale, you know, to rapid innovation, and, you know, what's your experience been like? It's definitely been... A, a sort of skyrocket of growth. If you look at even just something like the number of tweets per day, back in January 2009, we saw about two million tweets a day, which already seemed like crazy town, right? And then January 2014, it was, you know, in January 2015, I forget which day it was, we see now over 500 million mm -hmm. tweets per day. 500 million, yeah. Which, oh, yeah, like, that's, really? Yeah. Really? That's so many tweets, you guys. So, and you know, the, the other sort of shifts that we've seen is, you know, the majority of our user base is located outside the United States now. Mm -hmm. The majority of our users are accessing Twitter via mobile instead of on desktop. So there's been sort of, and that's, Twitter has always been sort of mobile first, like that's right. how it was initially constructed, but the challenges that you get when mobile is your primary access or when the sort of United States norms are not the norms of the majority of your user base, that's a whole separate set of scaling issues. Right, so what would be an example of a norm that's different from the US versus another country or region? Sure, I mean, well, there's, there is a wide array, everything from what sort of content is considered acceptable or, you know, this content, like, this is a rap video versus this is not allowed in this country. <laughs> Got it, right, okay, interesting. Uh, well, you know, speaking of that, I mean, Twitter is one of the places where people share stuff like videos and things go viral, and it's a place where the hashtags travel the fastest, maybe. Um, so, you know, what are some, you know, examples of how you stay on top of trends and memes? Because, of course, we've all heard of Black Lives Matter and Just We Charlie and, you know, the new one Michelle Obama unveiled. Some of you may have seen that was a big thing in Arabic, uh, you know, when Michelle Obama met uh, the Saudi, the Saudi king. But how do you stay on top of trends and memes and all of the different hashtags? I do my best. Uh, <laughs> we obviously, like, trending topics, those are the easy ones, right? right? Like, that's the ones where you get the list of them on the on the side. Of course, those are different for different countries, and it's different all over the world. We have a lot of 
you know, as my, as my department's grown and as we've expanded, there's obviously more people to sort of keep an eye out. What's high velocity? What are a ton of people talking about suddenly? What's, you know, where, where is there a shift in focus or discussion topics or so on? And then separately, we actually, you know, Twitter lends itself very easily to people telling me exactly how they feel about something and exactly what they feel I should be aware of. Yeah. So, you know, whether it be people who are reaching out, we work with a number of, you know, NGOs and nonprofits and organizations that we talk with regularly just about trends they're seeing. Mm -hmm. And then separately, there's also just the ability for anybody to say at Delbius, hey, like, are you watching this thing? Are you doing this thing? Right, is something happening that we should know about? I mean, you know, are there, do you see hashtags that people use specifically for abuse or for harm or for spam? So, I mean, there's sort of a few different variants of that. The spam stuff years ago was in a much worse place, right? Yeah. Spam hashtags used to be much more of an issue. There is also hashtags that uh, some may view as spammy and others view as an expression of their love for a given singer. Uh, <laughs> hypothetically. Justin Bieber. Um, um. <laughs> so many possibilities, really. Uh, so, you know, there's dealing with those sorts of things where it's, you know, one person's spam is another person's request that that person return to a country to do another concert there. Uh, Got it. You know, that's, that's a whole thing. In terms of abuse, there's certainly hashtags where there's a lot of conversation going on. It can be very polarized conversation. Generally, it's not, you know, being used solely for abuse. There's a conversation going on and potentially abuse on it as well. Hmm. If it was a hashtag that was being solely used for abuse, that would make it a lot easier for us to identify all of the abuse and, and act on it. So right. if we can get that out there where everybody will just hashtag their abusive <laughs> content that violates the terms of service, that'd be great. Yeah, well, I'll see what we can do yeah, about thank you. that. Yeah. So Sarah Milstein, uh, some of you may have heard her speak earlier from Lean Startup. Yeah, she's amazing. And I also spoke uh, at the Lean Startup conference just in December, and one of the tenets as she may have mentioned, is build, measure, learn, right? And I'm sure, you know, Twitter started as a lean startup, certainly. I mean, you know, is there an example of a dilemma that Twitter has gotten wrong and, and learned from? My favorite sort of example, just from like a coding perspective yeah. of where it was, it is only funny in retrospect because at the time it was not funny to people at all, was within the first year I was at Twitter, and this eventually we did learn. The right. learn part is delayed because this happened twice. In my first year at Twitter, we ran out of status IDs for the tweets twice. Oh. Like, okay. there just wasn't a way to put them into our database. So there were all these very intense engineering meetings. And I would be like, hey, so guys, you know, this tool isn't working. Like, it's not working. See, I'm pushing the button. It's not going. They're like, so if we don't fix this, the site will go down and it may never come back up again. And I'd be like, okay, okay, totally get that you're busy. Um, <laughs> can you just let me know when you've got that worked out? Because my button, it's, it's well, still not working. Well, right. So... <laughs> Yeah. But I'll let you guys go and fix that. So they fixed it the first time around. And I also resisted the urge. And I, was, I came perilously close to potentially being killed by my coworkers uh, because of this. I really wanted them to be like, I really wanted to be like, hey guys, just give me the highest number you got to. I'll throw it in Excel, do a plus one, and just drag it down. I'll get you a bunch more numbers you can use. <laughs> right, I can fix this. Well, right, so just so people understand. And I was like, understand. they might not realize that I was, you know, not... <laughs> So, yeah, that you were being super helpful. I mean, just yeah. so people are clear, you know, for those who are, you know, not as technical, you know, the status ID, every tweet actually has an ID so that you can track it, right? There's a link, you know, for that, a specific link for each tweet. And so what happened was that they ran out of numbers to assign to tweets. And so if you're doing your job, that means if someone's saying, hey, you know, my ex-boyfriend is stalking me and posting weird things, you know, they can't 
track it. So that sounds like a problem. Uh, it was. Yeah, and, I'm glad that, uh, you, that, that you guys got on top of that. We did. Eventually, <laughs> first we got on top, and then we had to get on top of it again uh, yeah. a little while later. <laughs> and I mean, a lot of that's to do with the scale component, right? right. It was like the initial burst of growth, people were like, when they fixed the status ID stuff the first time around, they were like, all right, well, that's sorted. <laughs> And then they're like, oh God, this, this isn't sorted at all. Like, this is not even a year later, and the, the database isn't going to store it. Like, we can't, oh no. Yeah. So we haven't done it since, which is great. Right. Well, you figured it out. So the flip side of that question, you know, are there some tough calls that Twitter has made that maybe caused some controversy or some, some pushback, but that you guys stand by now? You know, that in retrospect, it was definitely the right decision. Yeah, that's... That's a tough one on, on a couple of levels. I think the first thing that sort of comes to mind in terms of, you know, we made this call and we've, we've stuck with it uh, and, and we think it was the right one was figuring out, you know, when we, when we sort of looked at accounts and, the, and what we wanted to consider a violation, there's always this sort of temptation to say, okay, well, just look at the content, right? And... My concern with that is, you know, with, with a tweet, you have 140 characters. You often don't have a ton of context. And I was worried that if, you know, if we said, okay, well, you can't say these words. Like, there's no, like, no matter what else, you cannot say these words, it's going to be a violation on the platform. I was worried that that would have a bunch of consequences that we wouldn't want. And instead, we ended up taking into account behaviors, you know, what are the interactions between accounts? Was, is this a, you know, is this a two-way interaction? Is it one-sided? Is it, is there, have there been blocks? Have there been mutes? Has there, like, what's, what are all these other signals we can look at? Which I think, you know, we've, we have gotten pushback from time to, why do you even let people use, like, this word on the platform? But, you know, one example would be something like the word rape. Why do you let people say rape? Mm. Well, what if you're talking about your experience as a victim of rape? What if you're, you know, there's all these different reasons why you would want to be able to say these words and just making it so that words in and of themselves are going to be a violation of rules is a pretty slippery slope. Right, so how do you navigate, you know, as, you know, in your position, you know, the difference or the line between free speech and abuse? It's a really good question. And it's not one that we, like, we will never be at a state where we're like, okay, we've sorted this. Like, this is exactly how it's navigated. This will never change again. Like, perfect, right? <laughs> a lot of what we try to take into consideration is, like I said, the behaviors that are there. Is this, you know, are you sort of expressing your opinion to a group of people who all agree with you, or are you going out and finding people who you don't like and targeting them? Is, is it a two-way conversation, or is it a one-way diatribe? Is it, are there blocks? What are, what, what's the reputation of these accounts? How are they, you know, have others reported them before? What, all those sorts of things uh, get factored in. No, that all makes sense. So, you know, how do you predict and design protections for the unexpected, you know, especially for women who are experiencing abuse and harassment online? So there's a couple of components to it. One of, one of the things that, generally speaking, trust and safety uh, does with the company as a whole, we actually, I have a team within my department called Product Trust that works with every PM at the company every single product manager, everybody who's creating features, shipping stuff, everything. Then they work with those guys from when they start working on features through launch to make sure that we're baking in good choices and privacy controls and user settings and user choice from start to finish, which has been tremendously helpful. And, you know, sort of taking the approach of making sure that we're doing that from the beginning, then separately really pushing for users to have controls over their own experiences. So you have the ability to mute, you have the ability to block, you can choose who you follow, you can choose to see at replies from everyone or just the people you follow, like introducing those. And then finally, 
fixing the recourse side of things, making it so that if something goes wrong, you know what to do, you know how to get help, you know what your options are. Right. Actually, some of you may have noticed on at safety, which is the your department's uh, Twitter handle, that there was a big uh, upgrade or or you know new policy on um, how do you say uh, you know protections uh, for, for abuse. Mm -hmm. Do you want to describe both for people who are experiencing it, but also for people who observe that someone is experiencing abuse online? Do you want to talk a little bit about what led to that you know decision? Sure. So one of the things that we introduced recently was sort of what we term bystander reporting. Like you, you see something happening, sort of the old if you see something, say something type thing. Uh, you see something happening, you can, you know, flag it to us. It's not the same as if you're the person involved where you, you know, file a, a lengthier report, but you can flag it. That's a signal that we can then use to help prioritize the reports and handle them as quickly as we can. Along with that, we streamlined the reporting flow a lot that you actually use if you're reporting something that was directed at you. And these things could happen because last year, uh, and I guess time flies, so it may have actually been like end of 2013, beginning of 2014, we rolled out in-tweet reporting mm. and made it so that you could report uh, abusive content from the tweet itself instead yep. of having to go to the help center, find the forms, report it that Remember way. That. Yeah. So, you know, it's Super all helpful. of these things are very iterative, mm. uh, similar to, you know, how do you, how do you balance free expression and abuse or chilled speech, if you will. Right. You know, how can we keep working to improve this experience without, without removing necessary friction? Because there is a component of necessary friction. You don't want people filing false reports. You don't want people trying to, you know, do the sort of mass flagging stuff, all that kind of stuff. Right. No, that, that all makes sense. So we, you've talked a little bit about the culture of Twitter mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, how you're baking in, you know, thinking about safety um, and trust through the products. Uh, let's talk for a second about diversity at Twitter. That's mm -hmm. another cultural issue. I know that you guys just released your numbers on diversity pretty recently. What's been the reaction both inside and outside um, Twitter? So I think outside Twitter there was people expressed disappointment that you know Twitter was not more diverse and that's a completely valid reaction. I think there's, there's regularly discontent inside of Twitter mm. about diversity because people actually do want to work on that sort of stuff. We have, you know, we've had, a, it's called SWAT, which stands for Super Women at Twitter. Awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're tech super women here. We're supportive yeah. of that. There is nice. a there was a heavy super mm -hmm. women overlap uh, when we were <laughs> when we were discussing this. But uh, we've had that group has been in place for four plus years mm -hmm. now in some version. They've got a more recent iteration that they're really doubling down on. There's a women in engineering group, there's Twitter Open, which is the LGBTQ group, there's Blackbirds, which yeah. is the Twitter African American employees, there's uh, there's one for the Latino, Latina folks. There's there's one for Twitter women in design, which really like the most exquisite like pages. Really like <laughs> their, their pages stuff look looks sharp. Yeah, is yeah. what I'm saying. Nice. Uh, <laughs> a lot of design resources there, mm -hmm. uh, and you know there's been a lot of there are a lot of groups on it. I actually think we're getting a lot more support from the company as a whole. Uh, our CTO, Adam Messenger, does a lot of work with like Girls Who Code. Mm -hmm. uh, our previous head of HR, Janet uh, Van Hus, now actually is our VP focusing on diversity and inclusion. So okay. we actually have someone whose role is to try to push for these initiatives and try to make sure that we're doing better. And then, you know, I. I not to sprain my own arm, patting myself on the back or anything, but uh, trust totally and fine. safety. And, yeah, well, all right. <laughs> uh, trust and safety and legal at Twitter are actually both led by women. Uh, so our GC is a woman. I lead trust and safety. We actually have probably one of the higher percentages of diversity and you know, female male balance and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, diversity tends to breed uh, more diversity and inclusion, as it turns out. Well, and that's a good segue. I mean, this is the tech super 
Women's Summit. You're a tech superwoman for sure, both inside and outside of Twitter. You know, what challenges have you faced as a double minority, both female and lesbian? You know, how has that impacted your career path in tech? You know, I I would find it hard to say how it's impacted. My, I had a weird career path. Uh, well, to yeah. be fair. <laughs> uh, I would find it hard to say how it's impacted my career path, like Twitter, for example, only because I've never not been those. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say where I would be otherwise. Uh, but I can say that w a couple of the things that have been impacted by it, first of all, you know, part of the reason that I even fell in love with the internet as much as I did was this was this place that I could find others like me, that I could reach out, that I could find a peer group that accepted me for who I was. And I just, I thought the internet was the coolest thing when I, when I came across it. And I just, I just loved it immediately. And I think that's a big part of the reason probably why I did end up wanting to work in tech. And then once you sort of get to Twitter, I think it's actually been a real asset to me in my role ex specifically because so much of what I do is what I term catastrophizing, mm -hmm. right? Try to think of the worst thing that could happen. And the, like what someone who is perhaps not in a marginalized community comes up with is the worst thing that they can envision happening versus somebody who is in a marginalized community or a minority or whatever else are often wildly different, right? right? It can be very hard for people who, are, who have not had those sorts of life experiences or who aren't you know, sort of as sensitized to the things that can go wrong to figure out like, oh, hey, actually, you know, a good example is when we were talking about making it so that users could upload pictures to Twitter, upload photos. Mm -hmm. I, this was a while back. And to be, to be fair, I, don't, I didn't experience pushback on this, but I said, hey, we should really think about stripping out all the EXIF data on these images. I think it would be like, the G, the, if you take a picture with your digital camera, your smartphone, there is generally additional metadata in that image, like where it was taken, the you know, lat long of where the picture was taken, what the picture was taken with, when it was taken, all of those sorts of things. And that's all information that might seem very innocuous on, on at first glance, but if you are concerned about people identifying where you are or where you live or where you go, or anything else, that's a whole different dilemma. And you can't just sort of push that on to the user and be like, well, they should, you know, they should know if they don't want that and they should strip out that information themselves because the vast majority of people aren't going to actually know that that happens or know how to strip it out. Yeah, so, they're just going to take a picture of their cat in their apartment doing something weird. Yep. Right, and they're not necessarily We've expecting all been there. that someone. I I did that maybe yesterday. So you know, but I was I'm not expecting that someone is going. <laughs> you did too, though. You yeah. totally did too. I did. But you know, right? But someone doing that isn't expecting. Oh, someone can use that data to then find out specifically where I live and come attack me or just rob my house. Exactly. Home. Right. And you know, that's people were like, oh, that that would be a bad. thing. Thing. Like those would be bad. Okay, yeah. we will. We're going to strip that out. We aren't going to expose that information publicly. Like done. But you know, and why I can't say you know. Oh well, I only thought of it because I do think that it has been like that part of my background has made it so that I am a lot more aware of those sorts of risks and those sorts of needed protections. No, absolutely. And what advice would you give to? you know, women and other minorities, you know, seeking to blaze a trail in the world of technology, both based on your experience, but maybe on the experience of, you know, other women, you know, that you've encountered. I think, well, one thing I, I saw reference to it earlier that folks were talking about imposter syndrome mm -hmm. as, a, as a challenge. And let me tell you, I, I feel like in, in tech, that can really get dialed up because, you know, my role there, Twitter is unlike any other sort of platform out there in a lot of ways, which means that there really isn't any sort of precedent 
that I can go and look at and be like, oh, well, this is how it's been done before. It's really easy to start being like, oh my God, I have no idea what's happening right now. <laughs> Seriously? Ser really? Geopolitical tensions everywhere? Really? <laughs> And yeah. the fact of the matter is, you know, nobody else has, you know, a lot to base this stuff off of either. You're, you're in that role because you're nailing it. And you, at some point, you have to just be like, you know what? I'm going to believe in myself until I no longer feel like I have to force myself to believe in myself. And then you start seeing more of it. I think that, I think that it's really important to have faith in yourself and to, you know, I, I would say to, you know, pursue your dreams, but I'm not sure my dreams were exactly this. Uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to help people, and I felt like this was a great, a really great opportunity to do so. And, you know, in tech, the nice thing about tech is that there are a ton of people who do want to help. There are a ton of people where if you reach out and say, hey, can you help me figure this out? Can you help me, can you walk me through this? It can be hard to find them, and that's something that I know a lot of folks are working on, on addressing. Uh, but I think people generally in tech really do want to help others. I agree. I mean, as another woman in tech, you know, for uh, my startup, we've attracted $2 million so far in angel uh, funding. Yeah, which is a big deal for a female founded company. Uh, and, you know, with one of the founders being a minority, you know, that's, there's not a lot of us, right, mm -hmm. yet. Um, but I have found that people, if you're willing to ask, you know, I think that, you know, as women, one of the things that we're trained to do is to kind of shut up and stay in the corner and try to, like, observe until you know all of the answers and then raise your hand. And that's just not really how it works in tech. I mean, my job didn't exist, or jobs yep. didn't exist when I was a kid. I helped to create them. And the same, same. with you, right? Like, you know, and that's going to continue, I think, to be the case for a while. So, you know, I think that if you can not exactly fake it until you make it, it's not, it's not that so yeah. much as... You know, knowing, having the integrity inside you and to trust your intuition that, you know, if I don't have the answer now, I can, I can test and learn and grow and help my company, you know, or my organization grow at the same time. And I think another thing that's really important, and it's a, it's a responsibility all of us have, is if you see something happening that's, you know, harassment or just discrimination or anything else, speak up you yeah. know it's it speak like talk, if you see you know somebody who you think is struggling with it and facing it reach out to them right it's if you are operating in the vacuum of oh somebody else will deal with it or oh it wasn't that bad or oh like even if it's something that you can deal with do something to help the others who might not be as resilient or feel as equipped to handle it and i think that you know, it's something that we have to push for in, like, overall, no matter where you are in your career, no matter where you are in the hierarchy, if you're entry level to C level, it doesn't matter. Like, you can't let, you can't let wrong things pass unremarked. Absolutely. I mean, I can look back at even just the, like, a sentence that someone said to me, you know, after a meeting, you know, where they're like, hey, kid, I know that was tough, right? But you can do this. You're like, even the smallest things, you know, in terms of encouraging others, and I've tried to pay that forward as my career has progressed. You know, people, you know, I have, you know, high school students or college students or, you know, younger women who, you know, just randomly find me on the internet and ask me questions, and I try to be available, you know, when I can, to be encouraging, because you don't know what that can mean, or you don't know how much it can mean just saying, like, hey, that thing that Dave said in that meeting was kind of uncool and made me uncomfortable, right? Dave probably didn't know that, or maybe knew it and sort of like has been getting away with it for a while and knows he needs to stop. Oh, that's right? just Dave. They all yeah, say yeah. That. No, you know what? Like, not okay. Like, Dave needs to shut up. If there's somebody, so. if there's somebody <laughs> named Dave here, we're very sorry. Yeah, no, it's not you, Dave. It's not that Dave. Uh, okay, one last question before we go to 
go, go to questions. So you know, now that you've got these you know, new ways to flag abuse, whether as a target or an observer on Twitter, you know, as the head of Twitter Troll Patrol, basically, um, you know, what are a few tips that can help our tech superwomen you know, who may be outspoken online uh, deal with harassment or abuse that they might uh, experience? Yeah, it's the answers to that sort of vary from platform to platform. Overall, I would say make sure you familiarize yourself with the recourse that you do have on each site. Know what channels to use to report stuff. Take advantage of reporting stuff. Be you know feel feel comfortable reaching out to law enforcement if you feel threatened by something. Don't don't sort of be self-deprecating and be like, oh, I'm probably, you know, I'm probably overly concerned. It's not really a big deal. Like, if you feel threatened, you feel threatened. Trust yourself in terms of knowing whether or not it's something you think you should take to law enforcement. Make sure that you, you know, really, I know folks at, I think, mo like, pretty much every major company who work on these sorts of issues, they do care. There are people at these companies who really care about making sure that this stuff gets fixed and fixed right and that we keep improving and that we aren't sort of being blind to areas where we're completely whiffing. Give feedback, reach out, you know, we, we really appreciate that feedback. And I think that, you know, again, sort of a, the theme of if you see something, say something, you know, make sure, make sure that you've got others' backs, make sure others have your backs, have that support community outside of just, you know, well, you can report this to the company, you can report to law enforcement, but also have your community. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just from my own experience, I'm also known as the co-founder of a blog that used to exist called Jack and Jill Politics. It was one of the top black political blogs of its time. Thank you for those who know it. That's really sweet. I uh, appreciate that. It was a labor of love. But also, you know, we were black people saying crazy, outspoken things online. And sometimes, you know, they used to shoot at black people who did that. Uh, now they just burn down your router in your house, essentially, right? Or say pretty mean things about you online. And, you know, some of it, you know, Beratunde, my co-founder and I, you know, would just, you know, sort of just take it. But some of it, you know, occasionally we'd, we would, you know, have to reach out to people at places like Google or Twitter or Facebook and say, look, you know, this is something here is is wrong and, and we need your help. And and we were actually often surprised at how um, sometimes, you know, they hadn't didn't have things in place. We were pretty early, you know, on. Um, but, you know, where people were getting that in place, people were actually willing to help. You know, it does take a little bit of persistence and figuring out the channels, but I, I wouldn't, you know, don't, you don't have to, you don't have to take abuse from a troll, you know, who's threatening you. And the other, the other thing that I would sort of mention is, you know, just in general, be aware of what information about you is on the internet, right? There's a ton of information aggregators that, you know, have potentially any public record information. You may want to go through and request removal. Most of the big ones like, you know, Spokeo or I think it's white pages and tell us like right. there are ways to opt out of having your information be look upable. Yeah, that's good. That's we'll take that. That's All good. right. That's good. <laughs> be searchable and discoverable right. yeah. uh, on those sites. <laughs> and similarly, take advantage of things like two factor authentication mm -hmm. on your email, on your Twitter account, on your Facebook account. Take those steps to make it so that it's harder for you to be a target of some of the simplest types of attack. Yeah, I can actually, you know, quick testimonial before we go to Q&A. I used to get, I mean, I wouldn't be able to use Gmail if I didn't know people at Google. Like, people would just DDoS the, you know, the crap out of that thing, my Google accounts. And uh, once we put in two-step authentication for me and everyone at the companies, I, we, it's not a problem anymore, really. Like, two-step authentication is very powerful, simple to do. Um, it's a good thing. All right. Close to my heart. Yeah, two-step two yeah, two authentication. Factor. It's beautiful. So I think we have a little time for Q&A. Do you want to ask Dell some questions? Or me. You can ask me questions, too. Uh, how is that? There, I think there's some hands back there. I think we hopefully we have some mics going out to the audience. Yes, back there. Uh, yeah, I guess you can also talk loud. Hopefully there's we'll a get a, a mic. I think. <laughs> oh. 
Yeah, can you start over and speak into the mic just so everyone on the live stream can hear you? I have a question about stock puppet accounts. Sure. Created to abuse and avoid bans. Um, what kind of things are you guys doing about that right now? It's sort of, I mean, there's a bunch of different things that are in place. We're working on coming up with a lot of tools that sort of can detect if there are things about an account that make it higher risk of being one of those accounts and require, okay, well, you need to actually go in and confirm your email address by clicking this link in your email before you can start tweeting. You need to, SMS verification is something we're exploring. Uh, all sorts of sort of speed bumps almost in terms of trying to make it less of a trivial thing to create a new account and get around a previous suspension. One of the challenges that comes along with that, which I, which in no way means we're not working on it, but is just something that we have to factor in along with it, is that a lot of the behavior, a lot of the signals that you could look at for a, an account that's you know maybe created to be a sock puppet or anything else, can also be echoed by a dissident or activist who's trying to create an account without giving personal information out, without because they're, they are concerned that they're at risk. So a lot of what we do, because of the scale that we're dealing with, you know, I, I make the joke that if you say it's a one in a million chance, we've got it happening 500 times a day. So it's kind of a joke, and then I kind of get a little sad. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, that's true, right? If you think that there's 500 bad actors out there on the internet doing something crazy, that's a big, that's a lot of work. Yeah, it so, is a lot of work. Yeah. It is, but mm. that's, you know, there's a lot of, we're, we're trying to come up with a lot of sort of smaller levers that we can adjust to try to figure out the right balance there. Puppet accounts as soon as they get on. So they've been around for a while, they've just yep. been sitting there for use later on. That's Hi. It. Oh, wow. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Jamie McKenzie. I'm curious how Twitter um, draws the line in terms of creates policies around situations like recently um, there was a lot of controversy with Gamergate and women getting a ton of really abusive treatment on forums, on um, places like Twitter, where people are threatening to like come to their house and like do horrible things to them, and it's really invasive. And how do you, as a um, private enterprise, manage your boundaries with users that are treating other users that way? How are you addressing um, those kinds of comments about women in the public sphere? Because as a, some people's Twitter presence is so exposed, um, where do you draw the lines and, and what has been your experience with, with occasions of harassment like that on Twitter? So I can't, I won't speak to specific accounts or, or instances simply because we try not to blur the line around how much we discuss that sort of thing uh, outside of with the account holders, but in general, you know, violent threats are a violation of our, of the Twitter rules. Targeted harassment is a violation of the Twitter rules. If it's reported to us, we're going to act on it. Separately, and I guess also concurrently in some instances, if we hear from law enforcement on these sorts of issues, assuming obviously that they provide proper legal process, we're going to work with them as well. So, you know, we absolutely have law enforcement contact us in situations where there's been behavior that's, you know, potentially stalking or threatening or anything else uh, violent or that sort of thing. And we'll work with them to try to make sure they have the evidence they need to pursue their own investigation and bring charges. And, you know, it's sort of, it's, I think a lot of, you know, if you were to try to generalize what we do at a, at a high level, you know, abuse is not something that we want on Twitter. It's, you know, we absolutely, Twitter is absolutely a supporter of free expression. We absolutely think it's important that whatever community that you are in, no matter if you are a minority group, if you're a marginalized community, that you have a voice. And we think that's really important. But there is absolutely a difference between having a voice and expressing unpopular opinions and attacking someone or, you know, doing something that silences 
others. And that's a lot of what we try to figure out the balance between, and that's what we keep working on. And we also, as part of you know, all of this, we try to solicit feedback from people who have been in the events themselves, who maybe who have been sort of in the center of the eye of the storm, which I suppose would be the calm part, but you know what I mean. Uh, it's fine. We know you. what you mean. Thank you. Yeah. So they're in the maelstrom. We'll go with that. Oh, no, that's good. Uh, thank you. It's a big and work. you know, trying to get their feedback on, hey, what was super frustrating? What worked? What didn't work? What, what else would you like to have had? What could we do better, more, less, etc. Um, hi. Uh, I have a question. Some of my friends and followers have received emails after they complain of rape and death threats from Twitter that say. This is not against the Twitter terms of service. Um, I was just wondering why, I, I mean, like, what makes the decision, like, okay, this rape threat isn't against the Twitter terms of service and we're not going to ban this account? Um, and then another question I had is Has Twitter ever considered letting uh, high profile people who regularly get uh, threats like that uh, either, I don't know, make it go quicker to, to Twitter safety or um, automatically ban them. I mean, if someone who regularly gets threats and is regularly making people ban it, they just sort of have the ability to just be like, oh, this person is harassing me, uh, they should be banned from Twitter. So on the first question of, you know, why, what makes the decision, I don't know the specifics of those, so it's kind of hard to say what led to that or why. Uh, generally speaking, I would assume it, it would be around, you know, was it explicit? Where, how was it directed? Was it two ways? It's, it's hard to say because I don't know the details of those. But, you know, I can say that threats of violence, threats of rape, like these are against our rules. Uh, for the second question of, you know, is there a way to potentially escalate reports from people who are frequently subjected to abuse or give them the power to sort of automatically ban others? The automatic ban sort of without review uh, sends a little bit of a frisson of terror down my spine simply because that's the sort of thing that you could absolutely see someone gaming the system until they can then use it to abuse others, because any system you create to help with abuse will then be used by people attempting to abuse the system. Thank you, humanity. It's people. People are um, so creative. They and are. They, people do the darndest <laughs> things. Uh, but in terms of, and it's not just you know high profile people or verified people, if you've been subjected to abuse or harassment before, we do try to take that and use that as a signal to help with the prioritization of reports, and that's something that we'll be continuing to work on. I think we can probably take one or two more questions. Hi, uh, back here. My name is Liam McGowan here, and first I'd just like to say, love you guys, you guys are like fabulous. Thank yeah. you. I give it all to, it's all to, De it's all Del. It's all no, Del. You samba out here. Yeah, I do. Yeah, but you I didn't samba. I do want to see the samba again. I didn't miss that. But, um, and I would have never thought a conversation on security would have been really interesting and enlightening. I really learned a lot. A couple, I, I do have a question, and it's more around the diversity. So it may be a little bit outside of the realm of your immediate role. But I know Twitter released its numbers as, as well as many others. And you said that they brought on somebody to be in charge of diversity initiatives. Now, what I've often found in my many years' of experience in corporate America, well, not that many, because I'm not that old, but um, <laughs> that they'll bring somebody on to be the person in charge of initiatives, but if they're not reporting directly to the CEO or even one level below, then they're really not in a place to make change. And secondly, they tend to combine the initiatives with the compliance out of HR, mm -hmm. and then it becomes more administrative and not really change impact. So what has Twitter done? So we've dodged those bullets. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> the, we actually didn't bring someone in. Our previous head of HR moved into that role full time. So she was already at the company and moved full-time into that role. She reports to our overall head of HR who reports to the CEO. So 
she's, you know, like, a, I guess it's one level down is yeah, how you that's pretty, that's categorize good. that. Yeah, sure. uh, and then in terms of sort of how we, how they've approached the different initiatives, the compliance component is driven from a different section within that and works with legal more. And she's really focusing on like working with girls who code and Twitter women and women in engineering and all those sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, all right, yes, good news. All right, well, unfortunately, that has to be our last question. Our time is up. Uh, if y'all haven't seen Dell's TED Talk, uh, if you like this, you'll really like that. So look at it, share it with your friends. Almost a million people have seen it, so it's gotta be pretty good, I saw it. Uh, I also have a TEDx talk there, but you know, that's you can you can find that if you want to. Many thanks to Del Harvey oh, thank for you her guys for enlightening me. comment. And many thanks to you for coming. <laughs>